Hello, in this mind map, we're going to look at some of the main clinical pathologic entities in CNS uh, pathology. So first, before we start, I just want to look at a brief overview of some of the main uh, clinical symptom complexes or clinical manifestations of CNS disease. So the first thing is it raised intracranial pressure. So in this instance, uh, the patients may present with some headache that's worse on Valsalva Manova, vomiting, and also if you examine the patient, uh, you may see papilloedema in the fundus. It is very important to pick up raised intracranial pressure because of the possible potential consequence of cerebral herniation. So the next important clinical symptom complex is that of localizing signs. And for this, the onset is very important to take note of. If it is a sudden or rapid onset, you must think of vascular causes like uh, cerebrovascular accidents, bleeds or infarctions. Whereas if it's a more gradual uh, onset, then things like infections and tumors come into consideration. The next uh, main manifestation is neurodegenerative states. This includes uh, cognitive decline, as well as uh, motor disorders, as well as movement disorders. And these are usually uh, chronically slowly progressive. Now, in demyelinating conditions, uh, there can be motor impairment, sensory impairment, as well as autonomic impairment. And uh, the interesting thing about demyelinating conditions is that the clinical cause often waxes and wanes. So in other words, it's remitting and relapsing. Patients may also present with signs of meningeal irritation, and this includes uh, neck stiffness or rigidity, uh, photophobia, which is fear of bright lights, as well as headache. And uh, this can be seen in uh, meningitis, where there is actual inflammation of the meninges, as well as uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or sometimes uh, intrathecal drug administration, where there is irritation uh, of the meninges. Uh, don't forget, there can also be systemic symptoms, of course, such as fever and loss of weight, just like in any other disease of each system in the body. Next, we are going to look at a very broad overview of the classification of categories of diseases that occur in the CNS. And uh, you may be familiar with this mnemonic for classifying diseases, which is vitamin C and D. So very quickly, V is for vascular, cerebrovascular disease, uh, intracranial hemorrhage. I is for infections. T is for trauma or traumatic. A for autoimmune conditions such as multiple sclerosis. M for metabolic or toxic, perhaps alcohol-induced uh, vitamin deficiencies, etc. I for iatrogenic or idiopathic. And then N is for very big important category, neoplastic, of course, tumors, that is. And then C for congenital diseases. And finally, D, big category of degenerative conditions, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, etc. So with this in mind, uh, we can start looking at um, the specific clinical pathologic entities in the CNS. And uh, in this and the next mind map, I'm going to look at five main areas. So these include raised intracranial pressure, cerebrovascular disease, intracranial hemorrhage, neoplasms, and infections. So let's start off with raised intracranial pressure. And uh, this is defined as raised CSF pressure that is above the normal of 7 to 15 millimeters of mercury, and that, that's the normal figure in the supine adult. So the pathophysiology of this is very logical. Basically, it is anything that increases the intracranial volume. Because remember, the brain is a very soft organ and there's some fluid surrounding it and is encased in a heart cavity that cannot expand, which is a skull. So things that increase the volume include fluid as well as tissue itself. And we can divide the causes into diffuse causes versus localized causes. So among the diffuse causes would be cerebral edema, which is essentially swelling of the brain. Uh, some of the causes of this include malignant hypertension, encephalitis, as well as a head injury or trauma. There is another condition known as hydrocephalus in which the CSF volume is increased above 120 mils, which is the normal. And uh, just very briefly, hydrocephalus can be communicating hydrocephalus or non-communicating. 
and you can read up on the specific causes of this. So essentially, when you talk about hydrocephalus, um, for the pathophysiology, it is helpful if you try to remember how CSF is produced, how it flows, and how it is absorbed. And once you know that, you will be able to work out some of the causes of raised CSF volume uh, according to these um, categories of diseases here. So some of the localized causes of raised uh, intracranial volume include the presence of tumors, uh, bleeds or hemorrhage uh, within the cranial cavity, and also uh, potentially localized lesions like infections. So these are all considered space-occupying lesions. The danger of raised intracranial pressure is that it can result in cerebral herniation, which is the displacement of brain tissue into another compartment. And this, if it compresses on vital structures like uh, in the brainstem, this can actually be rapidly fatal. So it's very important to pick up raised intracranial pressure, hence to understand the symptoms and signs. Now, the second main entity we want to talk about is cerebrovascular disease. And we can sort of divide this into two main vascular events or outcomes, which is, uh, first of all, ischemic. And here we can see an example of a coronal section of the brain with this cavity here. This is classically what an uh, ischemic infarction looks like after some time. And usually there is um, minimal or only mild accompanying hemorrhage. So this is the ischemic outcome of cerebrovascular disease. The next main outcome is if there is hemorrhage. So this again is another example of a coronal section of the brain showing a large area of blackish hemorrhage in the region of the basal ganglia and this can be picked up quite readily on imaging scans. So we will be looking at uh, ischemic cerebrovascular disease and hemorrhagic cerebrovascular disease separately. Let's start off with ischemic disease. Uh, within ischemic disease, there are two main mechanisms. One is when there is global hypoperfusion. So this is essentially when the blood supply to the entire brain is compromised. And this can be seen in conditions such as cardiac arrest, of course, um, where there is systemic hypotension or low blood pressure and in states of shock. So in these instances, uh, the parts of the brain that are most prone to infarction are the watershed areas, which is essentially the junctions between the blood supply areas of the major vessels. Now for focal ischemia, this is where the, there are specific vessels uh, which are occluded, and uh, one of the most important mechanisms is that of thromboembolism. So causes include atherosclerosis, arteriolosclerosis in the smaller vessels, and remember, very important, predisposing conditions, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Uh, for embolism, uh, they can, of course, result from atherosclerosis as well, but they can come from a more distant site, such as a cardiac thrombi, which can shoot off systemic emboli into the uh, central nervous system. And predisposing conditions uh, include atrial fibrillation or sometimes post-myocardial infarction where there is an area of the ventricle, for example, the left ventricle that is non-functional and when there is a turbulent blood flow, this then promotes thrombus formation and therefore predisposes to emboli. Vasculitis, uh, inflammation of the vessels can also give rise to thrombosis. So together, um, these vascular events give rise to cerebrovascular accidents, and these are defined as the occurrence of sudden focal necrosis of the brain parenchyma secondary to a vascular event. And of course, very often this vascular event is ischemic. So uh, the other arm of cerebrovascular disease is the hemorrhagic arm, and one of the most common causes of spontaneous cerebral hemorrhage is hypertension. Um, from rupture of small vessels, and often this likes to occur in the region of the basal ganglia. We can also have underlying abnormalities of the vessels, uh, vascular malformations, and this is often seen in younger patients uh, with very, very sudden neurological deficits. An example would be arteriovenous malformation. There is also a condition called cerebral amyloid angiopathy. This is when there is amyloid protein 
um, deposited in the walls of vessels and this can predispose to bleeding. Of course, coagulopathies where patients uh, are also have bleeding tendencies or bleeding diathesis can also give rise to hemorrhage within the brain. The next entity which is actually related to cerebrovascular disease is that of intracranial hemorrhage. So we want to divide this into a clinically uh, useful classification system. So we look at the intraaxial, which is essentially in the brain substance itself. And this includes intracerebral hemorrhage as well as intraventricular hemorrhage. And the other arm, of course, then would be extraaxial, which is where the area of bleeding is outside of the brain parenchyma. In terms of uh, intraaxial hemorrhage, uh, we've actually covered already most of the causes, which essentially uh, overlap entirely with hemorrhagic cerebrovascular disease. So I won't go through them again. For extraaxial hemorrhage, uh, we can divide this according to the relation to the meningeal coverings of the brain. So this from inside out would be subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, and I have a picture here of subdural hemorrhage where you can see that this is the dura mater which is quite tough and actually this surface is the arachnoid mater and the, ble the bleed actually occurs below the dural layer and above the arachnoid. So this is subdural hemorrhage. And the final um, area of extra axial bleed would be in the extra dural space. So this is sometimes also called epidural hemorrhage. Uh, extradural or epidural hemorrhage. The causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage are quite uh, similar to sometimes uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, arteriovenous malformations, or another underlying vascular abnormality, berry aneurysm. This also tends to occur um, very suddenly, and often the patients will complain of a sudden, very severe headache, followed by focal neurological deficit or loss of consciousness. Uh, trauma can of course also cause extraaxial hemorrhage and any of these can be caused by trauma. In particular, it's important to remember that the subdural and extradural hemorrhage are almost always caused by trauma. So it is also important to remember at the, at the end of the day that cerebrovascular disease, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic, as well as intracerebral hemorrhage, can give rise to raised intracranial pressure because of increased fluid uh, in the cranial cavity and sometimes also from brain swelling. And with this comes the attendant potential dangerous life-threatening complication of cerebral herniation. So in the next mind map, we are going to look at uh, neoplasms very briefly as well as CNS infections.